Step one. Everyone, welcome. Hello, I'm Amy Sutherden, Assistant Director at the Center for the Study of Canada and Institute on Quebec Studies at SUNY Plattsburgh. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the first session of the Virtual Conversations on Canada Spring 2021 series. The Conversations on Canada webinar series is organized by the Center for the Study of Canada and Institute on Quebec Studies at the State University of New York College at Plattsburgh where we live and work on unceded Mohawk lands. In recognizing that all education in the United States and Canada takes place on ancestral indigenous homelands, we'd also like to acknowledge the crucial support we receive from the US Department of Education's Title VI at the National Resource Center on Canada and the Quebec Ministry of International Relations and La Francophonie. Developed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Conversations on Canada series addresses current issues central to a fuller understanding in Canadian society. Three sessions were offered last fall on topics included, why is Donald Trump mad at Canada? Understanding American foreign policy toward Canada. Second, the pandemic experience. How do Canada and the US compare? Third, the black experience in Canada, the race, state and persistence of social inequality. Recordings of these past presentations are publicly available on YouTube in case you missed them, or if you wish to reference them again, please do so on the YouTube Conversations on Canada channel. We're delighted to welcome today a diverse audience of participants and deeply appreciate participation from SUNY Plattsburgh students, faculty, staff, and alumni, business people of our New York State, North Country region, and beyond, as well as scholarly members of the Association for Canadian Studies in the United States. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today and please allow us to extend our hopes that you are in good physical and mental health during this challenging time. Throughout this webinar, we invite you to engage with our speakers. If you have any questions or comments you'd like to submit, please note the Q&A box on your screen. We ask that any questions you have be submitted specifically in the Q&A box. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Christopher Kirby, Director of the Center for the Study of Canada and Institute on Quebec Studies at the State University of New York at Oxford, and President of the Association for Canadian Studies in the United States. Thank you, Amy. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for your warm remarks, opening remarks, um, Amy. This is, uh, as you can see, I have a bit of a different backdrop. Uh, that you may want to look at. That's the new bridge that was constructed this week over Lake Champlain from Plattsburgh to Vermont um, to, to expedite uh, travel. Um, all jokes aside, it's a lovely shot, of course, of the Marin headlands and San Francisco in the background of the Golden Gate Bridge. Having said that, uh, we are absolutely delighted to be joined today by a friend and colleague, uh, Bernard Purley from the University of British Columbia. Um, who will be speaking to us today uh, on home and native land reconciling experiential Canada's. Today's an interesting day um, in the United States in terms of the indigenous communities and peoples because today uh, before the American Senate, Deb Haaland is set, to, uh, she's a Democrat from New Mexico and if all goes well, she's set to be confirmed as the first uh, indigenous American cabinet member. So, uh, it may seem like it's taken way too long, and it clearly has, um, but um, it's an important marker, to say the least. Um, Bernie's going to speak today, I think it's fair to say, in his description of his talk, which I'll be glad to capture for you now. The colonial Canada has exercised centuries of cartographies of discovery, conquest, and of course, erasure of its Indigenous peoples. Um, present day calls for reconciliation promises some measure of healing, but it seems to be in some regards insufficient. Uh, Dr. Perley will suggest only by remediating those cartographies of erasure can we map a future Canada based on true healing and sustainable futures. Um, by way of background, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Perley is a member of the Maliseet Nation from Tibet, uh, uh, which if I'm not mistaken, Bernie, uh, part of the uh, uh, Algonquian speaking First Nation of the Wabanaki, Abenaki Confederacy um, in lovely New Brunswick, Canada. 
If you've never been to New Brunswick, you need to go to New Brunswick. It's a wonderful place. Um, he's the director, as I mentioned, of the Institute for Critical Indigenous Studies at the University of British Columbia. He's president-elect of the Society for Linguistic Anthropology. His ongoing research is dedicated toward revitalizing Indigenous languages and Indigenous sovereignty and survivals. His critical creativity is expressed through cartoons drawn for Anthropology News, as well as his own personal series, quote, having reservations, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Pearl. Bernie, please. Oh, I should also mention as Dr. Purley gets ready for his remarks, should you have any questions that you want to ask of Dr. Purley, kindly put them in the Q&A box and I will moderate um, sort of a discussion uh, with, with uh, Bernie after his comments. So please feel free to just place them in the Q&A box. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for your uh, introduction and for inviting me to participate in the Conversations on Canada series. And thank you, Amy, for all your support in making these conversations successful. Kwebe Sedewen Dangak, Louise O. Bernard Perley, Wulistagwe Nukutkugnil. Hello, everybody. How are you? Uh, my name is Bernard Perley. I am a member of the Maliseet Nation from Tobik uh, First Nation in New Brunswick, in Canada. I am speaking to you from the traditional and ancestral non-ceded territory of the Hunkaminum speaking Musqueam people. I'm delighted to be virtually visiting SUNY at Plattsburgh and I acknowledge that I am a virtual guest in the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Western Abenaki peoples. The Abenaki are one of the five nations of the Wabanaki Confederacy along with the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, the Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet. And I begin this conversation with a story. In the depths of time immemorial in the darkness, first one point of light, then two, then three, then five, 10, a hundred, a thousand, a thousand points of light began to illuminate that darkness with celestial light. As time goes on, that celestial light coalesces and forms the moon. And that nightscape watches over quietly as the earth slumbers. Gradually, to the east, five rays of sunlight begin to appear. They get stronger and stronger, each ray corresponding to one of the five nations of the Wabanaki, Confederacy. And as the world lightens and the sun breaks the horizon, the world awakens. Along with the world awakening is also the Maliseet culture hero, Galuskab. Now, Galuskab is often described as a shapeshifter, a storyteller, a creator, a transformer. And he's responsible for how the Maliseet have come to know their traditional homelands as their homelands. And so as he, Kaluskab, was admiring his creation, he was alone. And so he decided that he needed his own people. And so he took his great bow and he took an arrow and he aimed for the heart of an ash tree. And as he struck the ash tree, the bark split open. And as it split open, a Maliseet woman and man stepped out. These are Malis, uh, uh, Gluskub's children. And Gluskub took care of them. And as he taught them how to survive in good relations with all other relations in Wabanaki territory, he felt comfortable that he can then go on to other places and organize and manage and create those worlds as well. And so he left the Maliseet to occupy and dwell in their homelands. After some time, Kaluska returns and he finds the Maliseet thirsty and sick. And he asks them, what's wrong? What has happened? And so they took him over to the river and the river had dried up. And they said that we're thirsty, we don't have any water. And this is when Kaluska really understood what was going on. And so he knew 
his nemesis, Guabid, or the beaver, was responsible for the river drying up. And so he goes up 40 kilometers to Grand Falls. And at Grand Falls, there he sees the giant beaver sitting smugly on his dam. He had blocked all the water and he couldn't get, get through to the Maliseet community at Tobik. And so this is where Gluskub, trying to take care of his people said, you know, beaver, you need to release some of this water for my people. They are getting sick and they're thirsty. And so the beaver says, nope, I'm not going to do it. And uh, so Gluskub said, well, you need to do that. If you don't do it, I'm going to take apart this dam myself. And so as Gluskub started to take apart the dam, the water started to trickle through. This is when the beaver decided, well, no, he's not going to stand for this. And the two of them fought and fought and fought. And as more water was escaping through the dam, this is when the beaver realized that he was not going to be able to uh, defeat Gluskub on that day. And so this is when he, in the muddy water, escaped from Gluskub and swam down river. And as Gluskub was, you know, you know, looking around in the muddy water to find the beaver, he realized the beaver had escaped. And so then what he did was he reached into the river and scooped out this huge boulder and he tossed it 40 kilometers down river. And so that rock splashed right at the point of the Tobik and the St. John rivers. And that point is right here. <clears throat> but when uh, Gluskub realized that he had missed the beaver, uh, that's when he said, I'm gonna have to throw another boulder down and he missed the beaver yet again. At this point, this is when Gluskub said, I have to go and catch the beaver. And so he transformed himself into a beaver and he swam down the river and finally caught the beaver about 30 kilometers south of what is now called Perth Andover. And the two of them again fought and fought and fought for days until both of them were just too tired to fight anymore. And so when they realized that they were not going to be able to defeat one another, they went to different uh, shores of the, uh, the banks of the river and they went their separate ways, knowing that they were gonna continue this conflict later. Now, the story I just told is a creation story, uh, but there is a lot wrong about the story. What is wrong about the story? One of the things that I wanted to kind of point out was, it, yes, it is a story. It's about a creation story. It is about origins, but it is also a story about erasure. It's about linguistic erasure. I told the story in English, not in Wolostugwe Ladawewagan or Maliseet. It's about community erasure. I told the story to a non Maliseet audience. It's about cartographic erasure. I told the story in virtual space, not on my homelands. It's about geological erasure, the submersion of the Tobik Rock and other sites that are part of our uh, storytelling tradition. It's about ideological or ideational erasure. Uh, together, all these erasures are just some of the ongoing processes of centuries of colonial cartographies of indigenous experiential erasure and forced alienation uh, from our homelands. The title of this conversation is Home and Native Land Reconciling Experiential Canadas. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But first, happy March 15th. Happy Ides of March. Uh, many, if not all of us, recall the Ides of March uh, as the day of foreboding in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Beware the Ides of March. Um, Idus Martier was traditionally a Roman calendar date and the deadline for settling debts. So the Idus Martier seems like an appropriate day to talk about reconciliation. Colonial Canada has exercised centuries of cartographies of discovery, conquest, and erasure of its indigenous peoples. Today's call for reconciliation promises some measures of healing, but that is not enough. 
Only by remediating those cartographies of erasure can we map a future Canada based on true healing and sustainable futures. And so one of the things I wanted to do is also, you know, go back just a little bit and uh, acknowledge the, you know, lands of the first peoples that we all are you know, settling on. And so one of the things that we do is we forget the deep, deep histories of all these first peoples, their stories, their traditions, their worldviews. And I really do appreciate Amy, you know, acknowledging uh, the, uh, the Mohawk territory. And I am delighted to also uh, recognize that uh, where Plattsburgh is, it's also the westernmost extreme of the uh, Wabanaki Confederacy. And so uh, for me, I'm delighted to be able to virtually visit the Wabanaki homeland. And so today's conversation is just that, it's a conversation. And uh, in some ways it's a virtual coming home. And so I decided to wear this uh, medallion that my brother made for me. And it is a depiction of home. It is about the hills along the St. John River and the photograph is above my shoulder back here. And so again, it's bringing all these stories and experiences home. But how do we as contemporary natives understand uh, you know, our sense of home and how do we share that with others? Okay, so it's today about the settling of accounts. What accounts do we have to settle? Uh, one of the things that I want to highlight is this aspect of erasure. And so one of the things I wanna do is share with you uh, some of the maps. Uh, this uh, map is uh, a map, let me switch the camera here so I can actually see what I'm doing. <clears throat> is a, uh, a Le Cabo map of 1609. And if you look at this map, what you can see is that this is, a, of course, an early map of discovery. And so in the area, uh, pretty much where you are all living, if you're in Plattsburgh, uh, is that um, <clears throat> you can see that the um, uh, Les Cabo had indicated the uh, uh, etchemins down here towards the bottom. And so the Etchemin were the first, uh, you know, contact with the French. And so the Wabanaki peoples were then called the Etchemin. And so that map of discovery was followed by uh, this uh, Nicolas de Fer 1698 map. And so again, you can begin to see that uh, you, you see colonial inscriptions of place names, but you still also see some uh, recognition that for, for example, uh, the Techemin nations right here. And so there's a recognition that there were first peoples here, that this was their land, that they were nations. And so those maps of discovery are significant in terms of recognizing that the first peoples here from Europe recognized that there were native nations on this land. And we shift then to cartographies of conquest. And so this is a really famous John Mitchell map of British and French dominions uh, from 1755. And you can already see that the United States was planning on expanding all the way to uh, the West Coast. <clears throat> yeah, those were going to be very, very big states. <clears throat> uh, but one of the things that if you look at the, you know, this detail of that map, uh, and you look in this particular area, just at the border where it says Acadia, running through Acadia is St. John's Indians. And so what happens is that we go from Etchemin to St. John's Indians. So this is one of the maps of conquest. And so we are no longer independent nations that we become uh, something that the colonial powers can then label onto us. And so these maps of, uh, uh, you know, conquest uh, is an assertion of territory and the kind of, let's say, uh, <clears throat> denial of indigenous rights to their lands. 
And you can see in the John Mitchell map that the United States already had plans to go from coast to coast or as they put it, from sea to shining sea. But Canada was no different. And so one of the things that they did was they published this uh, and created this Dominion map of 1867. And so uh, if you look at the detail in New Brunswick, uh, this is where you begin to see that we're seeing the maps of erasure. The Maliseet are not on that map. We're not even called the Etchemin. We're not called St. John Indians. Uh, we don't even exist on that map. And so in this map of uh, Rand McNally in 1895. Again, up in this area, there is no indication of, of Maliseet peoples. And, but we haven't gone anywhere. We've been there since time immemorial. And so what you can see in this kind of cartographic process is the, this map making from discovery to conquest to erasure. And so at some point, native peoples didn't figure in the national imaginary of either the United States or in Canada. And so this is where, for me, one of the arguments that uh, I recognize that we have to pay attention to is this idea of how do we then reconcile this difficult history uh, with what we are facing today in terms of reconciliation. And so I go back to the story. What is right about the story? And so for me, one of the things I wanted to do was highlight that story uh, to share something of Maliseet culture with you so that you know something of the homelands, of the cultures, of the people, of the deep time that we know and share with one another about Native North America. American history, North American history, didn't start in 1492. It started 12,000 years ago. There's so much that we have to learn from one another. And so for me, as a person who got a fine arts degree uh, at the University of Texas and a master's degree in architecture from University of Texas and anthropology PhD from Harvard, I have a great deal of investment in understanding Western knowledge systems and aesthetic systems. But at the same time, for me, what is really important is that in all of those studies, all those degrees, it did not take away from my appreciation for Maliseet culture. And that is why I wanna share with you uh, these baskets. And so again, we were made, came out of the ash tree. And so the baskets are both ash uh, as well as uh, sweet grass. And so this is one of the fancy baskets from Tobik First Nation. Um, this delightful little basket is also a strawberry. And again, it's ash, it's one of the fancy baskets. And of course we have a blueberry. And so for me, one of the things that I want to kind of highlight is that cartography is not just about map making, it's about world making, it's about cosmogonies. How do we understand and create worlds? And so for me, this is where uh, this presentation allows me that opportunity uh, to begin to think about, well, how do we together create a new world? How do we map a future for Canada? And so I want to share a couple of maps with you. Uh, this one is from my uh, ethnography, uh, Defying Maliseet Language Deaf. And uh, I created this map uh, for the book. And so one of the things that I did was I identified, of course, the, the state of Maine, the province of Quebec, and the province of New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island. Uh, but I also included not just the uh, you know, First Nations, uh, reserves, but also uh, some of the uh, uh, cities in both, you know, New Brunswick and in Canada. And a little later, another map was created in this huge, enormous dictionary. And so this is uh, the Maliseet Passamaquoddy Dictionary, and they too provide a map <clears throat> that rethinks the colonial sensibilities and so it highlights uh, the Maliseet First Nations. And so what we're seeing is a different way of looking at cartography. Uh, so what we see is that, you know, there's a reinscription of native places uh, in their native homelands. 
What's really key about this is that the most recent map I want to show you is from the series of Indigenous Peoples Atlas of Canada. And, uh, and so it comes in four volumes. This is actually the atlas itself. And uh, I want to kind of show you what's really intriguing about this. Okay, so this is where Tobik First Nation would be. What is really interesting about this map? It's a different kind of erasure. You don't see Fredericton. You don't see Perth Andover. You don't see Bangor, Maine. You don't see any colonial settler cities. So it's reverse erasure. And so this is the indigenous map. And so one of the things that uh, I wanted to point out also on the preceding page, what do you think that city is? It's just a gray blob. <laughs> and so one of the things I want to point out is that I worry that erasure is going the other direction. And so for me, if we're going to reconcile Canadian imaginaries, what we need to do is reconcile not just the fact that, you know, both peoples, indigenous and settler peoples are going to be living and occupying what we call Canada. Uh, for me, it's more about remediation. How do we not just recognize one another and address one another in respectful ways, but how do we find mutual healing? And so for me, it's not about in the entrenchment of one you know, epistemic system, whether it's indigenous knowledge systems or another epistemic system, call it Western knowledge systems. Uh, it's not recognizing that you know, those are uh, separate systems. What we need to do is recognize that both systems have a common goal. And that common goal is to live peacefully and in health and well-being for our communities. And so for me, the goal is a mutual project. And so it's useful to be able to work from our respective positions as me as an Indigenous person, uh, but also uh, to reach beyond my particular life experience to be able to understand you know, other life experiences. Now, the usual arguments about you know these kinds of you know binary opposition secular society versus indigenous society it may be useful to start the conversation but it's going to break down because neither society whether it's indigenous or settler society are you know totalizing experiences and so for me this is where we can work from how do we recognize the beauty beauty and the gifts of uh, one another's uh, uh, positionalities, and how do we imagine a future where both of them are going to be stronger? I would say that because of my interaction with Western aesthetic principles, my work in terms of Maliseet storytelling and Maliseet art are even richer. Hold on just a second, I'll be right back. I want to share with you one of my more recent cartographic explorations. And so Christmas Day, here I am in Vancouver. I'm in lockdown. And uh, because of COVID, I can't go back home. And so I am missing the snow. I'm missing the cold weather. And I am just missing being in my homeland. <clears throat> and so how do I recognize and create a map, a, cosmog a cosmogony of, you know, Maliseet? And so I sat down and I created this. Okay, so for me, one of the things that I want to point out is that that drawing is partly about how I imagine and understand and use Western aesthetic principles, but also to tell a Maliseet story. So that is, uh, uh, Bunib Nibayabanib. So it's the, 
what do you call it, uh, snow on Christmas Eve. And so it's about home. It's about being able to imagine being there and sharing with everybody else the beauty of the Maliseet homeland and the Maliseet experience. And so if we can open our conversations to this kind of sharing, I think there is going to be a good, positive, healthy future for all Canadians. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie, for a wonderful engagement this afternoon. I have a couple of questions to throw your way. I do have one observation. One of our uh, uh, contributors, participants who've joined us uh, over the last year, Annie, is asking if you don't mind, if you could hold up your medallion a little bit closer to the screen so everybody can see the image that your brother conceived of, imagined for you, that'd be great. Thank you. Oh, wow. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, we have a, a, a question that came in earlier and that is, um, you know, you, you've sketched out for us this afternoon how in the Canadian experience and particularly in New Brunswick areas, we call it, um, there was a sort of a, a process, a process of at least in when you measure it in terms of the cartographical experience, you see discovery, conquest, erasure. Um, is that experience that uh, experience in cartography is that is that Canada specific or would you see that or do we see that for example in the context of the United States as well be it New England or elsewhere for me one of the really interesting things about uh, having uh, gone to Harvard but also teaching at Dartmouth and you know uh, also at Cornell uh, you know, that's New England, it's New York. Uh, and so one of the things that <clears throat> the, uh, what was uh, interesting to me was that, uh, you know, the historian Colin Calloway uh, noted that when the old world settlers came over to the new world, they didn't come here to keep intact this new world. They brought the old world with them trying to improve the old world. And so that's why it's New York, it's New Jersey. Uh, it's, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, all these, you know, the, the kind of inscription of colonial worlds from back there to here. Now you'll have these occasional instances where Massachusetts is also uh, the name of a, uh, uh, a, a group of first uh, peoples. And so you do have these particular inst instances and you also see markers and some city names uh, or town names with you know, these uh, native names, but mostly what happened was they brought the old world with them into the new world. And so for me, one of the things that's really intriguing is uh, you know, when I was in Wisconsin, okay, Wisconsin is a native word and I was in Milwaukee, that too is a, a native word, uh, but at the same time, uh, the you know citizens of Wisconsin were largely ignorant of the first peoples there, and uh, and speaking as linguistic anthropology was really fascinating because you had like three different language groups there, and so it was like you know a really rich cultural indigenous community, uh, but most people are just you know uh, uh, ignorant of it or you know blind to it. And so I think that process of uh, erasure, you know, first discovery, then the kind of conquest and then erasure, I think you can see that in most colonial situations. Yeah, that makes sense, to say the least, uh, and certainly in the context of the United States. Uh, we have uh, a question, if we can uh, throw you away, Bernie, um, and that is um, in the context of your presentation, you use the phrase imaginary. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues is curious as whether you can say something about our ability to move towards a national or international imaginary um, with the many nations and cultures that coexist in what is now called North America. Yeah, I think this is where uh, 
uh, it, it's important to recognize that all of us, you know, as I said before, you know, it's not just, you know, the kind of easy binary between indigenous peoples and settler uh, societies, because we recognize that it's much more complex than that. But one of the things that we can do is look at how, you know, in terms of our imaginaries, uh, and for me, it, it, it's, it's, it's linked to how we know things. And so uh, it's the conditions of our knowledge and experience. Uh, how are we socialized in our particular kinds of worlds? And so as children, we don't have much say in how we're being socialized. We have to deal with it. Uh, but as we grow into adults, we can be, and some of us are often very critical of the way we've been uh, socialized and raised. And so these imaginaries are the sites where things can change. And so one of the things that I worry about today is that uh, uh, because of COVID this past year, we all had to deal with particular kinds of challenges and everything that we took as normal was upended. And, uh, and so everybody has that collective imaginary of, wow, you know, that was weird, that was a tough year. And we're still dealing with that. Uh, but what I worry about now is the kind of imaginary that uh, uh, suspects that or anticipates we're gonna go back to normal. Mm -hmm. And so this is where I'm really worried about that particular imaginary. Uh, and so the imaginary is constructed from all these conversations, from all the different news media. Uh, but for me, what's really critical is that these imaginaries can change. And so there's a substrate of, let's say, uh, preconceptions or perceptions that we're all dealing with. It's only when we come against another perception that challenges us that it begins to uh, make us question perhaps our own positionalities. But in that kind of questioning, can there be a mutual alignment of hopeful futures? And so for me, the project is not about the past, and so when I told the story about the uh, 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 Tobik Rock, uh, it wasn't really about the past, it's about today and it's about tomorrow. And so the stories of deep time, uh, some part of the imaginary is, oh, they're just so stories. Uh, but if you think of them as lessons for now and for tomorrow, then that changes the role these uh, stories play. And so for me, the imaginary is that site where it's malleable, and it's something that we can work with. And that's why I share these stories. And, and this is a, a follow-up question, and it's a perfect question, particularly given the focus in Canada over the past, uh, let's say 15 plus years on notions of reconciliation. And that is, um, to, to what extent, uh, Bernie, do you feel that non-Indigenous persons are truly ready to appreciate the idea of altering uh, imaginaries. I think this is where, for me, uh, <clears throat> I go back to you know I was telling my wife the other day. You know we were talking about these kinds of uh, uh, topics, and, uh, and and the question was, do I privilege my indigenous background, knowledge, my worldview as an indigenous person over a, uh, a Western uh, imaginary or, you know, worldview. And I said, no, not really. And, and this is where uh, I told her, I'm not going to give up Beethoven. You know, I'm not going to give up, you know, uh, Homer. I'm not going to give up all those rich contributions to my knowledge uh, and how they inform how beautiful my own Maliseed culture is. And so by learning these other systems, we begin to appreciate our own system even more. I mean, that's, that's, that's the stance I take. And I do worry both on the part of indigenous students and non-indigenous students when they shut themselves off to those other possibilities. You know, I do worry that some indigenous students will say, I don't need to know that stuff. You know, that's, that's just, you know, uh, the Western colonial, you know, and it, it's created all this harm. Well, some of it has but there's a great deal of beauty there that we can share. And just as, you know, native peoples, when you look at, um, you know, the Aztec, <laughs> you look at the Incas, you know, we've all had these, you know, episodes of conflict. 
Uh, and so this is where, you know, uh, but then we also have amazing works of art and, uh, you know, systems of thought that we can all benefit from. The key for me though, is that as we look ahead because of climate change and all the kind of challenges we're going to be facing, uh, the communities that have dealt with the first wave of the sixth extinction and the first wave of climate change are the indigenous peoples of the Americas because our landscapes and our worldviews, our world systems were dramatically changed. And so there were entire nations wiped out from the diseases, from uh, relocation from their homelands to another place. And so in all of that, the surviving First Nations offer lessons of survival. We're going to need those lessons down the line. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, some, ob some observers have suggested that <clears throat> whereas reconciliation in, in a Canadian context was very much front and center on the social and political radar screen um, before the outbreak of the current COVID-19 pandemic, that perhaps momentum has been lost. And do you see, for instance, um, once we've been able to effectively tackle this pandemic, that there will be a sharper focus again on reconciliation? I think that, uh, and this is where, you know, I, th that's an intriguing question and, uh, and the prospects, uh, when I think about my comment earlier about everybody wants things to go back to normal, uh, they're not gonna go back to normal. Okay, so if reconciliation was occupying a particular kind of uh, uh, energy, and momentum, and then COVID comes along and shuts everything down. What I hope is that that momentum is going to be reinstated, but there's also going to be a recognition that, well, and this, this is a conversation I've had a couple of times, <clears throat> the devastation of the pandemic is just the most recent in waves of pandemics First Peoples had to endure. And so this is already in our cultural memory. And so uh, one of the things that we can do is prepare all of us together for additional pandemics. How do we deal with this? And so if we recognize that we're in the same boat, uh, that reconciliation is not just about uh, righting the wrongs of, of colonial society, as much as reimagining how we can work together towards the future. I think that's the kind of reconciliation I'm interested in. And the pandemic might be the catalyst to move us towards that kind of reconciliation. You know, you're right. It may just prove to be that catalyst. When, if, if, for people who think more broadly and, and in an enlightened fashion, I think you're right, um, very much so. We have uh, an interesting question. We have a young, person, and this is good, I'm just happy to see this undergraduate student at SUNY Plattsburgh, Peter O'Donnell, who's thinking of going to grad school, perhaps in Calgary or Victoria, to work specifically on Indigenous language revitalization. And he is looking for your insights or recommendations as to where he should go when he comes north. So, I think that uh, the first thing to do is uh, uh, recognize, you know, why you want to do this in the first place. And so if there is a commitment to helping a community, that's, that's really great. Uh, but one of the things that you have to recognize is that uh, it can't be a, a hobby of two years as you get your master's degree, or it can't be a hobby of seven years as you go from master's to your PhD. Uh, but it's a commitment to a community. And so for me, one of the things that uh, drew me here to UBC uh, to direct the uh, uh, Institute for Critical Indigenous Studies is the combined programs, First Nations and Indigenous Studies and First Nations and Endangered Languages program. And so what we're doing here is a commitment to community uh, research. And so all our research projects are you know, in concert with community interests and concerns. And, uh, and I'm delighted to have the uh, Musqueam language program as part of the, uh, the Institute. 
And so for me, it's that kind of community uh, building that's important. And so as you think about, you know, a, you know, a master's program or a PhD program, don't think of it as in, in purely academic terms, think of it as a commitment to community. And so for me, the, the work I see that's the richest is that commitment to community. And that's when the exciting stuff happens. Uh, because it's not just book learning, it's not just creating documents, uh, but it's also sharing world views. And this is where the best exchanges come in. So my advice would be to look at what the different programs offer uh, and see what kind of commitment they have to communities. And, uh, and the other thing would be, uh, you know, th this, is, this is an opportunity to really define your world. Uh, oh, I loved graduate school. You, you know, this is when you get to define who you're going to be. And so I identify that particular goal and just imagine what your possible futures are going to be. That's uh, really strong, wonderful advice. Peter, I hope you find that helpful. Um, Another inquiry for you this afternoon, Bernie. Are there positive instances outside of the North American framework where uh, we can point to where imaginaries have been altered and altered in a positive way um, between sort of, you know, Indigenous peoples, settler? Yeah, I think that, uh, <clears throat> I think all of these relations, uh, and again, this is where you know, we're, we're all constrained by the binary opposition of settler and indigenous. And it's, it's really unfortunate because if you look broadly, then it's really hard to see any positive uh, outcomes. One way to think about it is uh, the positive outcome I can point to immediately is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And so you, we can see that there's an example of how many nations can come together and recognize the rights of indigenous peoples. So that's huge. Uh, and I understand and I have conversations with colleagues in Australia and in New Zealand uh, that on a local level, there are many, many positive examples of how these kinds of, uh, let's say, mutual uh, attempts at world making for the future uh, are taking place. But at the kind of national level, it becomes a little trickier. And this is where, for me, again, the uh, enticement of being able to be in the conversation here in Canada on reconciliation and recognizing the uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, is a moment in this particular nation where they're addressing this issue. And I think that depending on how things go in the next five, 10 years, this could be the example uh, to put forward so that other nations could also follow suit. Uh, the good news is that uh, there's some reinscription taking place. Uh, the city of uh, Edmonton is renaming their uh, districts to accommodate the different languages within the city, the indigenous languages in the city. Uh, last week, one of the council members here in Vancouver uh, put forward a motion to adopt the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a working principle for governing uh, Vancouver. So we're seeing these small actions take place. Uh, but, uh, and so that's what I'm excited about. If we keep pushing and uh, working together, we may see even more high profile cases where you know, we begin to see the kinds of futures being you know, mapped out for both uh, indigenous and settler peoples not just as indigenous and settler, but you know, as a community. Certainly, certainly. You mentioned uh, during the course of your uh, conversation today, the uh, Indigenous Atlas series, um, four volume set, I believe you said, one of which was the actual Atlas itself. Um, can you give people a sense that, that it was obviously um, a tremendous production, must have been years in the making, involving scores of scholars and tribal leaders, cartographers. Um, tell us a little bit about that, if you would. Well, I can't talk 
too much about you know the particulars of how that project came about, but it is you know totally significant. And one of the things that uh, the other three volumes are dedicated to, you know, I've got them right here. So they have Indigenous Peoples of Canada, First Nations, and they also have Métis, Métis right. and the Inuit. Okay, and what is significant about all of these is that it recognizes indigeneity in Canada in all the in this, these broad terms. Uh, and, but it goes back to the earlier question about imaginaries, and this project is significant in the imaginary. Uh, as you pointed out, you know, it took a lot of work to create the atlas. And so when you think about all these different maps and the atlases, it takes a lot of conversations, a lot of talented people uh, to sit down and create one of these maps. And so when you think about all the conversations that go into these, uh, then you see the map. The map is a snapshot, just a snapshot of all the imaginaries that came together to produce that map. And so for me, this map, this atlas set is a significant shift in the Canadian imaginary. And so for me, it's more projects like this that are going to move us forward. They're mapping the future. Now, as I pointed out, the, the fact that they did erase Plattsburgh <laughs> from, <laughs> from the map is not necessarily a good thing because you know, the citizens of Plattsburgh are not going to move away. And so just by not putting the label there, it doesn't mean they disappear. So we can't do the same kind of erasure of, you know, settler towns and names. What we need to do is recognize we're in this together. And so that's going to be the important imaginary. Right. Well, what do you think are the biggest impediments to national governments embracing reconciliation. Let's think of it in the Canadian context, if you will. Um, if you look at, at it, in, if only the one example in terms of looking at the nearly 100 recommendations that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, and some observers who've been decidedly critical about uh, Justin Trudeau's government embracing let alone uh, following through on, on a significant number of these uh, recommendations. There seems to be some hesitancy and one of our observers is wondering, what is that source of hesitancy? Well, I think that, you know, part of the imaginary, if you will, uh, is that, and a lot of people, you know, really, they may not acknowledge it, but it really informs their perspective. And that's the zero sum game. That if, if a right, or a concession goes to one person that somehow I will lose uh, right. my position. And so it's that fear of losing something uh, in your possession or of your person uh, that I think is creating this fear. And so rather than looking at, uh, looking at these kinds of conversations as a mutual benefit, it's a zero sum game. And so people don't wanna give that up. And if you think about you know, climate change, for example, this is where uh, for me, you know, it's a, the science is out there, you know, the evidence is growing every single year, every single week. Uh, think about the snowstorms now in the, the Rockies. Uh, and then, oh, in Texas, holy cow, Ooh, <laughs> they see that one coming? No way. No. <laughs> uh, and so, again, this is where the, that zero-sum game uh, creates these kinds of oversights. And so we need to share the information so that we can work together to mitigate these kinds of problems. Right. Um, I've got a, uh, a question to ask, and that is um, colleagues of mine at the University of Maine some years back, not all that long about, not all that long ago, quite frankly, produced um, what is an absolutely uh, terrific map, um, uh, and it's. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance personally to see this map. It's a, um, and if you look in the chat function, you'll see the uh, uh, hyperlink to it. It's it's um, it, it's uh, considered to be a you know uh, superlative uh, work, and and I just want you to, in case you weren't aware of it, to to bring it to your attention. Uh, 
it's gotten uh, some national awards and, and is a uh, great work of scholarship by, by many accounts at least. So, um, and I also wanted to mention while you're browsing at that, Bernie, we've had one last request. And fortunately, one of our one of my colleagues and friends did not have an opportunity, did not have his screen on the time you showed your brother's beautiful medallion. And if you wouldn't mind showing it to the screen, because he very much would like to see that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and with that, I'm going to actually turn the conversation back over to Amy Southerton. Um, to bookend things, but I want to ask everybody first to please join me in thanking Dr. Crowley for a remarkable afternoon. Thank you all for your attention. Well, Dr. Crowley, if I may, um, could I just ask you to show the medallion and say some words because we have it on speaker view. So when you're showing um, it, People are not able to see it because you're not speaking. Okay, the medallion is an abstraction of tropic first nation. So as you look across from the point uh, towards the east and see the sunrise, uh, you can see the sunrise between the hills. And so we are Wabanaki peoples. We are people of the dawn. And one of the things that's uh, significant about this is uh, the word Wabanaki comes from the Maosi word squabin. Squabin is the first light of dawn, or better uh, translated as it is dawning. So it, it's, it's more about process rather than a noun. Thank you. Um, at, at this time, I'd like to ask the audience for feedback on this session via the Zoom poll being presented on your screen. And I'd like to thank you, uh, Bernard, and also Chris for this important conversation on Canada. And special thanks to our virtual audience participants and to our many supporters at SUNY Plattsburgh, the US Department of Education and the Quebec Ministry of International Relations and the Francophonie. We do have two conversations on Canada coming up this season. And I'm going to go ahead and put those uh, announcements and links to register in the chat. So on Monday, April the 5th at 2 p.m., that's Eastern time, the topic is, what if the US had Canada's notwithstanding clause? Constitutional lessons from the North with Dr. Kevin McMahon. You can register for that at tinyurl.com slash Canada conversation, April 15. And third in the series is on Monday, April 26 at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Is the relation, is the special relationship back Canada and U.S. issues after 100 days of Joe Biden with Dr. Frederick Gagnon. So um, we hope you'll join us for our next conversations and really appreciate uh, you joining us today. So thanks again for your time and wishing you a nice rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.